Oh, hi. Didn't see you there. Enjoying this wonderful pizza from Slice on Broadway. The people in Pittsburgh that provide good pizza to podcasters. Hey guys, it's the Wrestling Mayhem Show, episode 66. That's how many times we've gotten here and talked to independent professional wrestling as we do. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on Twitter, of course, doing production here with the International Wrestling Cartel as well as the Renegade Wrestling Alliance. And anybody else that can help out, get the DBI coming up in Ohio here in May. We'll talk about that as we get closer to it. And also with me, my usual compatriot from San Antonio, Texas. He's a commentator for Inspire Pro Wrestling down there. And and uh, frequenter here on a wrestling mayhem show for several several years. The former wrestle fan, as I almost called him <laughs> tonight on the former show. How you doing that, that this week? Back in the old days, yes. How you doing? I'm I'm doing good. I'm I'm very excited to uh, to once again be on, and and, and it, I always look forward to talking about. Uh, independent professional wrestling uh around this time of day i want to apologize and, and explain my slip up earlier because i i was going across the, the spread shirt store that we have set up and i found an old shirt that says i am the real wrestle fan and i can't remember what happened that that came up that we put that up on the store and that kind of yeah. that got my that got that old name of yours in the back of my head i think back so. back when i was too creative to come up with a, a, a username hey <laughs> you were the wrestle fan 2000 so you know which by accounts means most likely you were born in 2000 uh unfortunately but um anyways hey i've worked for techno team right uh but of course this is the indie mayhem show where we like to have a guest every week and talk about some aspect of indie wrestling and some thoughts and things going on because we love to work around it and uh we hope you guys uh, enjoy it as a fan as a worker as as anybody else i hope you like what we're doing here uh for the past over a year now uh you can in get involved with us let us know what you think uh and you can also subscribe to this and other shows on wrestling mayhemshow.com uh we have video and audio formats though so you don't know where you're finding us of course and please comment uh, at mayhem show on twitter wrestling mayhem show on facebook the great facebook group there's a lot of conversation as well as google plus and please give a, a shout to our friend basic sickness at basic sickness.com the intro and outro music for this and the wrestling mayhem show and, of course, you can join us live here. We start all the wrestling talk about 9 p.m. Eastern time at live.wrestlingmayhemshow.com. And we try to kick this off around 11 p.m. or so uh, Eastern time as well. So I want to kick it back over to Eamon because uh, this is a compatriot of yours that's joining us tonight. It is. It's a very much a, a direct compatriot from uh, uh, my time at Inspire Pro Wrestling. Uh, uh, he is one to normally join me at the commentary position. Uh, to provide play-by-play, -play, but he also has many roles around the uh, the Texas independent wrestling scene as a manager, uh, uh, leading what he calls his rabid empire. Uh, and yeah, he's been you know uh, uh, definitely an interesting partner. I've I've gotten the chance to work with over over the past uh, oh close to a year, I would I would say. Um, but uh, it's a pleasure to have on the show this week the one and only Nigel Rabbit. Nigel, how are you this evening? Oh, thank you so much, Eamon. I'm 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 doing quite well, thank you. Fantastic. It's really, really glad to have you on. Um, so to kind of go into this and, and, and the, com the common question we start with, which is kind of like an icebreaker of sorts, uh, since, you know, we all get into professional wrestling because we, I assumingly first watched it. Um, what is the uh, first ever memory you have of professional wrestling? First ever memory I have of professional wrestling, believe it or not, is actually, um, after coming to this country, um, I was in a, uh, uh, a primary school, what you uh, what you would call elementary school, and uh, I was uh, going to the school uh, store to purchase supplies, and, and you know this is back when you know, uh, you give you you know some some money and you go and you, you buy you know kitschy little pencils or, or erasers that don't really erase, and then folders with various you know, uh, you know cartoon figures, celebrity figures, and. What I ended up purchasing was a Ricky the Dragon steamboat uh, uh, folder, sight unseen. He just looked cool to me. Mm. Um, and and uh, ever since then, I've been a Ricky the Dragon steamboat fan. Awesome. And then did that? Did seeing him sort of get you to start actually going forward and watching it on, on television? Uh, and and what did you think? You know, when finally getting to sort of see professional wrestling beyond beyond the uh, the school folder. Well, uh, 
<clears throat> I, <laughs> amusingly enough, uh, uh, like like every young man, I suppose, I I proceeded to see what this was all about and see what I could do. Um, I, I watched it, and uh, um, very soon after first starting to watch it, I uh, well, I I did a pile driver on my younger sister. <laughs> Um, as, it was as, on a as we're one to very soft, it was it was a it was a very soft bed, and, and to actually, to be honest, that was when I realized that there was no way that uh, professional wrestling could be real, because uh, you know we, one of the things is you, you know but at that point the pile driver was on its way out as the finishing move and had transitioned into uh, a part of the regular move set for a number of professional wrestlers, so. Now, to see someone take a pile driver mid-match and still continue after doing that to my poor, poor baby sister, and, yeah, I mean, literally everything stopped, and it was on a nice soft bed. Um, you couldn't have asked for a better better place to, to, to bump like that for. And uh, bless her heart, she uh, screamed like the dickens, and uh, I was promptly grounded from professional wrestling for a number of years. <laughs> so, so, so definitely uh, something that wasn't always always fully accepted in your household. And I mean, it's it's kind of interesting <laughs> to see because we get a lot of wrestlers sometimes say that you know bad people that you know people surrounding them that were supportive of it, and others obviously not not so much the case. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I have to be I have to be honest. I mean, when it comes to uh, supporting professional wrestling, my family was well. My mother was 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 primarily against it. My father, um, who happens to be an Episcopal priest, uh, Church of England, uh, uh, Anglican Church, um, he, um, <laughs> he 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 was a he, he was a great fan, and uh, so uh, we would uh, we would go to uh, house shows together and things of that nature. Um, and we went so far as to uh, uh, neither of us cared terribly much for. Um, Dusty Rhodes. We felt that, uh, especially in his, his uh, WWE years, when he was squaring off against uh, the Million Dollar Man. Yeah. And uh, true story. We, we uh, by the time we moved to Texas, we were uh, uh, sitting and watching the match. And my dad was just, we, neither of us were enthralled with Dusty. We didn't want to cheer for him, but we both felt very highly of Ted DiBiase as a performer. And so my dad looks at me and says, "You want to have fun?" I was like, "Yeah, sure." So we start cheering for Ted at the top of our lungs. You know, kill him, Ted, kick his arms, rip his head off, that sort of thing. And uh, as we we're probably no more than five, five seats or, or five rows away from the ring. Um, and, and so somewhere in the middle of a, a, a ten count punch uh, on the turnbuckle, Ted DiBiase stops and looks around because he's hearing someone cheer for him. He <laughs> spots me and my dad grins and goes back to walloping dusty roads that's amazing um and the other fun part about it is um is you know my my dad very proud of, the, of my father as a priest um you know he's a, he's a great man he's he's now got uh, two books written one based off his doctoral thesis which was uh, uh evangelizing the church uh, uh, books entitled Leading Christians to Christ uh, uh, Evangelizing the, the Episcopal Church and uh, he's written a fiction book entitled The Burial lovely little murder mystery book um, he's working on a second one right now um, very proud of him as you can probably tell Definitely. and um, he and I are, are sitting there and he's wearing he's wearing his full clerical regalia he's got you know the jacket the, uh, the, the, the banded collar shirt with the uh, priest's collar in it and he and I are just yelling up a storm. You know, whatever we can say and, and still, you know, say it with your uh, uh, young y young teenage son. Uh, and um, this uh, this uh, local Texas couple. I mean, imagine local color as best as you can. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the you know typical stereotyped modern Texas. Well, not modern Texas. Let's think of it. As, more of the negative side of that stereotype. <laughs> I don't want to say white trash, maybe redneck, but somewhere in there, you think of your atypical, or your your typical uh, lower intelligence, uh, lower intelligence uh, Texas wrestling fan. There you go. Definitely. And um, <laughs> they're, they're sitting like maybe, maybe five, six, seven seats away from us, 
uh, my dad's on the other side of me. And so we're yelling, and, and of course we're, we're cheering for this you know, millionaire to continue beating up on this common man. What terrible people we must be. And so <laughs> they keep shooting us these terrible looks. I mean, just absolutely daggers. It looks could kill murderous things will be occurring. And eventually she gets so, the, the wife gets so mad, she leans all the way out so she can get a good look at my dad. And she notices the car and she pops up quick as can be, looks at her husband, which, you know, means that she's got to tw- turn towards my dad and I. And she says, and this is what my dad told me, she said, swear to, swear to God. She turns to my, she turns to her husband and says, watch your fucking language. There is a priest down there. <laughs> and that was my introduction to a Texas wrestling fan as well. Cause I'd never really, you know, prior to that, my family was living outside of Cincinnati. So, you know, I, I was used to more, you know, Northern rednecks. And, uh, you know, if you go further south, you, you deal with the Kentucky hillbilly, uh, uh, you know, quotient. Um, but it, there's something very unique about uh, about the the just folk of Texas. Um, you know, it, I know it sounds like I'm trying to say, trying to say nasty things about, but I'll, I'll be honest. My father was most impressed when we first it was like the first year we were in Texas, and he's standing in an Albertsons grocery line, uh, a grocery line, and and he's standing there, and um, there is a little old woman who is taking her time as the little ladies do and then uh, about uh, one or two people maybe the very next person but it may be at a little distance there was a woman who was very very impatient um, my my dad's response was she must have been uh, she must have been from either New York, New York or or, or for, further northeast because she was just terribly impatient and not 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 polite by any stretch and she's there complaining up a storm and uh my dad is is watching this very uncomfortable. My dad, my my, my dad's a, you know, if you put him into a corner to say something, he'll say something, and he will probably knock you on your ass the way he says it. Mm-hmm. But he, he's uh, in situations like that. It's more of a hmm, I don't know exactly what to do. Well, standing right behind him was the, the quintessential Texas good old boy, you know, blue jeans, uh, you know, pretty pressed blue jeans starched uh, a button-down shirt with the, the, the pearlescent button, cowboy hat and boots. And after a little while of this this northern woman kind of, you know, being snippy and, to be honest, a little bitchy uh, at the little old lady, uh, the, the, the Texan leans over and goes, ma'am, we're going to have to ask you to be a little bit more polite and exercise patience. Y'all in Texas now. <laughs> just, went, just went right back there. I mean, the woman went shame face, and my dad turned around and grinned at the, at the, at the cowboy. Is probably the and my dad's response immediately was, you know, the, the Texans do things differently down here. Um, we've come to find uh, out of our travels uh, throughout the uh, U.S. that um, uh, Texans tend to be the more polite. You know, uh, it, which is really funny because they don't have that stereotype. You know, uh, you, you've got the stereotype of you know the ten gallon hat. Everyone rides horses and carries six shooters. Um, but I really and truly, um, I've never, I've never encountered, uh, quite so much openness and, and, and warmth. Um, I, I think it has a lot to do with why, um, outside of actively being, um, you know, in, in front of the wrestling fans, I and mean, you can attest, this is part of the reason why I'm such a warm person to the folks. Um, in, in the locker room and, and, you know, take care of everybody best I can. And Texas has really, really rubbed off on me in the, you know, uh, be, be kind to your fellow man. It's, it's definitely, I, I think it's definitely a state that has that u- unique aspect that's very different than anywhere else uh, uh, in the country. And, and I think that, that shows a lot in the wrestling crowds. I, I hear a lot of people talk about how Texas wrestling crowds are just so much different from anywhere else, too. And I, and I guess that, that's kind of uh, what translates there. Um, I definitely definitely see what you're saying. Um, so to go from uh, uh, watching professional wrestling, uh, uh, well, first of all, what encouraged you to actually get involved in the actual business? And, and, and obviously you, you um, currently uh, – have a, a big role on the outside of the ring as a manager and, and also a, a commentary. Uh, but do you ever have any aspirations of becoming a professional wrestler yourself? 
<laughs> yeah. Um, yes and no. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be honest, I'm for, I, I'm just about to be forty. I'm be forty in November. So um, I, I think pursuing an actual career as a professional wrestler is is, is something that's a little bygone for me at this point. Mm. Um, I mean, if I were to do it, it would be purely as a um, purely as a lark and to just enjoy it. Um, it wouldn't be with the aspect uh, or, or the, uh, the the hope of, of being picked up by uh, WWE or, or uh, TNA or, or ROH or Japan or anything. I mean, because I mean, I mean, at this point in sees what it's it's April right now, right? Mm-hmm. So in seven months to go to places like Louisiana. I'm going to have to do things like, even as a manager, I'm going to have to do things like get chest X-rays and other things to prove that I'm I'm in physical condition to be able to uh, pass the uh, pass the state requirements. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's no longer just a matter of you know take 12 pints of blood and call you in the morning. <laughs> uh, so um, I'd love to, but I think I've started too late. Now that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be doing anything. I mean, like for example. Um, I've had some people uh, suggest that perhaps I should, you know, get in there just, just based off the simple fact that, you know, fans would love to see me get my comeuppance. <laughs> um, and and uh, from a story perspective, it very much needs to happen. If I don't get my comeuppance, if, if like for example, if if I'm if I've been this righteous bastard, and and I don't get some kind of real comeuppance. Um, then, then the entire story is blown because, regardless of whether or not, um, um, you know, something like you know, uh, my wrestlers have lost the title or they've lost a big match or anything like that. If I've stuck my oar into each match and done as much damage as I possibly can and interfered and made the fans as, as furious with me as I possibly can, and I don't get, you know, I, I don't get so much as a, you know pop in the eye or anything like that. Right. Um, there's a missed opportunity. Um, I hate advocating that I get hit, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it makes perfect sense. You know, um, I, I've been I've been very blessed here recently to be working with Charlie Haas in MWA Texoma. Mm-hmm. And and Charlie has been invaluable to me uh, on, on teaching me new and inventive ways to get heat. Uh, uh, new and inventive ways to, to infuriate the crowd, but at the same time still realize that, you know, I could be the, the greatest villain. I could be, I could be the next Paul Heyman, the next Bobby Heenan, uh, the next Jim Cornette, uh, the next Skandor Akbar. But if I don't get my comeuppance at the end of everything, I've wasted it. Definitely. You know, it's, it's kind of like, and I, I, I hate to be critical of, of my betters because honestly, I mean, they make money. I mean, real money. They make a living at it, and and you know, <laughs> income-wise, uh, uh, I'm sure the federal government would refer to professional wrestling for me as a hobby. Um, but I, I, it's one of the reasons why um, WrestleMania last year with Brock Lesnar defeating uh, the Undertaker felt like a waste. It wasn't. It wasn't because we we didn't want the Undertaker to lose. It was because Brock Lesnar didn't need the rub. The, the the streak was wasted on Brock Lesnar. Not that they haven't done a wonderful job with it, based off of, of you know what happened. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they they did they haven't used it well. I'm saying that the streak should have been given to someone up and coming to cement them as the next big thing or, or the, the the next frightening monster. Um, it, it should have gone to someone like um, uh, Bray Wyatt or Roman Reigns or someone someone like that, someone who is coming up the ladder, someone who is is in the process of cementing themselves as, you know, the, the next uh, wrestling icon. And instead, it goes to Brock Lesnar, which if it was a call that happened on the fly because of injury, as some people have supposed, um, then you know, I, I can't argue with it. If it was an actual decision to say, we're going to give it to Brock Lesnar because Brock Lesnar is the only guy that we can think of at the time and um, Taker wants to hang up the boots, 
than want to take over Russell Bray Wyatt this year. That's true. You know what I mean? And um, but I, but I agree completely, and I think that's that's so that's something that's so prevalent in professional wrestling is um, the, the the stuff that I guess separates the good from the bad is the is the fact that when you build to something like a like a streak or or like even you mentioned like small stuff like getting heat that you know the 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 payoff is is what's key that is what's key in a sense. Yeah, you know it is. It's it's um like for example, um how many how many uh, films or, or uh, television shows do you watch that when the ending is bad, the show may have been brilliant, but the ending was bad, and so that sours your entire taste yeah. of the whole movie. You know, um, like, uh, a perfect example is um, uh, Jeffrey Rush did this uh, brilliantly performed. Um, wonderfully, uh, uh, wonderful looking, beautifully filmed uh, movie entitled uh, Quills based on the life of the Marquis de Sade. Mm -hmm. um, very, very difficult. I mean, the, the difficult film to watch because, you know, the Marquis de Sade was, you know, first of all, a, a, a grade A pervert, but at the same time, you have to, you, you look at all the things that he went through and some of the, the, the stuff that, he endured while in the asylum where he wrote some of his, his greatest pieces of oh, <laughs> literature, I guess would be the easiest way to put it, erotica. Um, <laughs> and uh, the way that he was abused and the way that he was treated and the, the, the literal torture. I mean, you look at it and some of the things that they were doing to the Marquis de Sade, the United States government were being yelled at with uh, uh, supposed Al Qaeda terrorists waterboarding and that sort of thing, um, and, and the movie is brilliant. Joaquin Phoenix is in it. Jeffrey Rush, Michael Caine, brilliantly performed. Beautiful, beautiful film. But the way it ends, it, it it ends almost without ceremony. The film just stops. It goes to black. No credits. Um, and I went to go see it with some friends and. And one of the friends was so incensed at how the film ended, they tried to demand the, mo the money back because they felt that they were robbed from that movie. Now, it, it, it's like that in professional wrestling. The problem with professional wrestling is, is if the booker is doing the job right, we're telling the story over you know, a, a matter of months. In the mm -hmm. case of things like The Undertaker's Streak, decades. Um, case of uh, my 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 biggest complaint over the past uh, past WrestleMania, uh, a matter of months uh, with the uh, uh, Triple H and, and Sting story, mm -hmm. uh, and to end it flat, to end it with no ceremony, to end it with you, you just it grates on you. You just kind of sit there and go, "Well, that was a waste." Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I think that that uh, like. The movie sort of comparison is a lot of stuff I hear a lot with that case is also it's very important to start strong and end strong. Uh, the the mm -hmm. middle can really define whether it's great or good or, or whatever, but it, as long as you have that strong beginning, strong ending, that's like that's you know it, it, it's usually you know can, can consider decent and it could be considered you know something people can sink their teeth into. Yeah, well, generally, I mean, if you have a strong finish and a strong end, and the middle is just meh. Then I mean, honestly, you can end up with something that is highly reviewed um, and, and and well regarded. Right. Um, you know, but when you you've and, and I think that's if I were to say that there were if I were to point out my my two biggest I guess pet peeves or or, or issues with independent professional wrestling, um, my my first one is is the decided lack of cooperation. Uh, between promotions when, and, and between wrestlers when there shouldn't be uh, any kind of dissension. We should be trying to build the business together mm -hmm. as a whole to make it to make it something, to make it closer to what it once was. Um, but the other thing would be there are a lot of a lot of independent shows that will start well, have a good middle, and just kind of go <laughs> at yeah. the end. And, and I mean that's, that's devastating for a fan. I mean, um, let's let, let's let, let's go ahead and, and set the Wayback Machine to 1998, uh, Halloween Havoc. Yeah. Uh, Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior are, are having their their uh, second meeting 
And it is, you know, the, the fans fervent hope that the ultimate warrior, despite his blatant lunacy, God love him and God rest him, uh, it, that, that he will be able to pull victory from the foaming jaws of the villainous Hollywood Hulk Hogan. And the match that we got with all the theatrical build up in the middle, um, sometimes the ridiculous appearances um, uh, of the ultimate warrior and what we get is a match that wouldn't have been acceptable during WrestleMania six. Yeah. It's just coming. Bless, bless ultimate warrior for being willing to sell a fireball that went off on Hogan's hands instead of being thrown at him. Hmm. But at the same time, my first response mentally to that is he didn't throw the fireball at you. Kill right. it. <laughs> you know, someone and, someone and, will and, figure out a way. Yeah. And to think of that show as a whole too, if, you know, talking about having a strong end, you know, if, if that show had ended so abruptly, uh, at least on the pay-per-view feed wise, I, I, I think, you know, maybe people wouldn't have been talking as, as, um, as angrily about Hogan Warrior, you know? Okay, exactly. Oh, yes. Yeah. Especially given how good I, I personally, I think uh, 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 Diamond Dallas Page and, and uh, Bill Goldberg were some of Bill Goldberg, one of Bill Goldberg's very greatest matches mm-hmm. because I mean they went after each other. It was brilliant, brilliant. And you know, I mean, I'll give I'll give full props because I, I know I know uh, Mr. Goldberg was very was, was still reasonably green. I want to say he was about a year into the business, right? Um, at that point, and and was still feeling his ways around, whereas um, uh, Diamond Dallas Page, personal hero of mine, mainly because of the fact that he started in the wrestling business, um, like actively trying to wrestle at the same age as I came into the wrestling business. Um, so uh, <clears throat> and I just didn't wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, um, you know, I mean, props to, to Mr. Goldberg for his intensity. Uh, and I mean, this is sheer, sheer physicality is amazing. Uh, and then for Diamond Dallas Page to, with Bill put together such an intense competition. I mean, to this day, it's probably one of my very favorite matches. And it was, you know, at the time, I, I couldn't have told you I wanted to win more, one or the other because I mm-hmm. love Diamond Dallas Page. And I, I, I love Bill Goldberg, and I, I just wanted to see what would happen. Absolutely. And, uh, so, but that's, I mean, had we ended on that note, Halloween Havoc might not have been the, uh, um, well, I mean, it was a financial bloodbath for WCW. Yeah. That was one of the biggest, the biggest pay-per-view losses during the, the good times because of that, that horrible you know, feed-cutting incident. Definitely. And then, but the, I mean, I think that just goes exactly to your point. How you know, strong, strong, strong endings, and and leaving people with something is, is really what it, in the end it's all about. Um, uh, going towards um, uh, your role as a manager, and, and mm-hmm. uh, we kind of sort of discussed uh, uh, some of the aspects that come with you know, being being in the role that you're in. Um, do you, what do you find is your favorite things and, and the most difficult things that come with being a, pro- a professional wrestling manager? And then leading your rabbit app, rabbit empire. Excuse me. Well, I, I think probably the, the the most difficult thing that I uh, that myself and probably any any independent professional wrestling manager really mm-hmm. um, is the fact that WWE employs three managers. Yeah. Four, if you count. If you well, I guess to me is not really a manager anymore now that AJ's gone. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you, you've got Paul Heyman. Zeb Coulter and uh, the lovely ravishing Russian Lana, <laughs> and that's it. You don't really have anything else. I mean, anybody else who uh, who, who is anybody else who comes ringside with someone is usually a, either a, a worker themselves or um, is um, uh, the tag team partner. I mean, right. So, um, and, and even though a lot of independent professional wrestling uh, companies will say, well, we're not the E 
um, a lot of them all want to be. And, yeah. And, and that's not necessarily a negative thing. I mean, no, no, no. you know, it, it's, you, you're tr- you want to follow the most successful business model. And um, right now, the most successful business model is WWE. You know, if you want to be successful, that's, that's who you look to. It makes perfect sense. Um, but at the same time, it means that you're also going to shortchange things. WWE does not use, um, uh, quote unquote, little men to the, their full advantage. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the the, uh, the greatest accolade that, that smaller wrestlers everywhere got was the fact that they gave um, Rey Mysterio his championship run, and then his championship run was all narrow escapes. None of it was he out wrestled and out performed. It was all it all came across very much luck in the draw. Yeah. Yeah, ooh, he was very lucky that time. Um, and I think that's a disservice because you take a look at in, in the, you take a look at the state of professional wrestling uh, in the independents, and you take a look at some of the talents out there, the uh, the, the Gregory James, um, the Barrett Browns, uh, the Jason Silvers, uh, the 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 the, the sheer talent that these young men have, um, and, and I mean, really, and they can go. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, there's there's no doubt in my mind, no matter what I might say in commentary with you, there's mm-hmm. no doubt in my mind that some of these young men are, are if, if they're not being looked at seriously by the WWE, then WWE's lost its mind. Um, I mean, but... but but the thing is, is uh, back back to your question, um, because no one uses managers very much in in, in the big show. Um, a lot of companies have the, well, why do we need to hire a manager? Yeah. Why does so and so need a manager? Um, I forgot I, I've forgotten who said it, but someone looked at me and said said said, why do you need? Why do I need to to have you? I can talk. My response to them was, well, of course you can talk. But that's not the point. The point mm-hmm. is you don't need to talk. Um, yeah. Gregory James. I love Gregory. He's, um, I, I've watched him grow um, almost since the very beginning of his career. Almost. Um, and, and Greg has grown and uh, uh, his unholy Gregory James businesses, I, I think, Absolutely exquisite. It really connects fans. Fans love him, though. He can change his gimmick all day long. Um, they they tried this in, at Metroplex Wrestling in Dallas, in, in the Bedford area. Um, they tried shifting him to a heel, mm-hmm. and that's um, that's actually, if I recall correctly, that's what started the unholy Gregory James uh, gimmick. Was because uh, Greg was originally. Uh, the headbanger Gregory James, and he turned heel, and the fans only followed him as a heel for so long. He was only like a heel for like maybe two shows, mm. and his pure athleticism stole their hearts. Now, with a talent like Gregory James, uh, and because of his size, you don't want him to do big man moves or or you know. Uh, keep everything slow because if he keeps everything slow, no one's going to believe that, that he can do the things that he can do. Because in comparison to say, for example, oh, uh, Killer McKenzie, after that, that that tag team battle royal that you and I commented at yeah. the the uh, last and Spa Pro show, he, no one would have believed Gregory James could do the things that he did to Killer McKenzie had Gregory moved at the standard. Uh, heel pace. Yeah. So, so how do you get someone like Gregory James over as a heel? Well, you give him a mouthpiece, and you and the mouthpiece says Gregory James is too good to talk to people. It's got nothing to do with whether or not Greg can talk. Yeah, it has yeah. everything to do with the fact that Greg's not going to talk because he's better than you. Um, I, I think that's a. I think that's the thing a lot of people do confuse is that they feel that a manager is only necessary. For somebody like, like say a Brock Lesnar, who kind of gets criticized a lot of times uh, for his uh, promo ability, or uh, uh, someone like Rusev, who speaks a different language, 
Uh, and I think people think it's kind of only limited to that, but I do agree with your point completely. It's not only, it's not always a necessity. Or, uh, I don't know if that's the right phrase, but it's not only because you need to fill a, a, a talking perspective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's a, it is a disservice to everyone involved in a wrestling show. If you assume that you don't need a manager because, uh, you don't have anybody on your roster who, uh, you know, can't, can't talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If they don't have mic skill, yeah, they need a manager. Sure. I understand that. I mean, let's be honest. Um, you know, having, <laughs> having, having Mr. Fuji did brilliant for the powers of pain. Yeah. And that was amazing because Mr. Fuji nor the powers of pain could actually really talk. I mean, you know, Mr. Fuji was one of the greatest ringside heels, but his ability to cut promo was broken Japanese um, at best. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and, you know, Bob and the Warrior, well, well I, I've forgotten exactly where Bar- Barbarian's from, but you know, Barbarian is, was, you know, English is a second language, and uh, uh, the Warrior was one of those, or not the Warrior of the World, was one of those impressively huge men that they didn't feel the need to cultivate his uh, his promo ability because you look at him. He's amazing. He's humongous. We'll put a manager with him. He doesn't need to talk. Yeah. Now, so, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's the overall mindset. If you can't talk, you need a manager. If you can talk, you don't need a manager. Some of the greatest people that I've worked with and, and some of the people I've enjoyed the most working with have been guys who can talk. I love mm-hmm. working with Gigolo James Johnson. James can can talk. And he does. <laughs> um, now, um, as his manager, a couple of times I've, I've had to pull him aside and say, I'm your manager. Let me at least have some of the promo time with you. Mm-hmm. I don't mind give and take. But let me let me also, you know, do some do some good work. That way you don't have to carry everything. Um, you know, uh, Carson, Carson and I, um, you, uh, in, uh, IPCW about three, four years ago, um, uh, I managed Carson and, you know, and Carson was, was tremendous fun to work with because at the time he was, uh, uh, he was doing his, uh, uh, his arrogance gimmick. Uh, and now, um, we throttled a young Ricky Starks again. It was very, very fun. <laughs> but, um, I, I think, I think that's the biggest obstacle in the independence is is proving your worth uh, as a manager because well, promoters don't necessarily want to you know shell out money for someone who you now may or may not be what they're looking for right and it's it is really it's really hard to get good tape from a wrestling company. Um, I, for example, I'm just, you know, um, you know, in, Inspire Pro is an excellent example of a company that, that, that's been doing it correctly because, I mean, you know, the number of pictures that, that Joel has taken of, of <laughs> you and I, I mean, just, you and I just commentary and we've got publicity photo material out of just stuff that, that he snapped just because he went, ah, look at those two. That's true. Um, you know, but it, in in a lot of companies, it's hard for a manager to get attention because they're outside of the ring. Um, uh, now, for anyone listening, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying managers deserve attention uh, above and beyond what's outside of the or above and beyond what's going on inside the ring. That's not it at all. My job is to enhance what's going on in the ring. My job is to make uh, the uh, villains more villainous and the heroes more more heroic. Mm-hmm. That's you know my my job is is to enhance the the, the talent, um, but at the same time, I can't carry my talent from promotion to promotion to promotion to promotion w- unless I can show other promoters that I'm valuable. And unfortunately, uh, especially in Texas wrestling. Um, you don't have a whole lot of promoters going from show to show to show just to see what's going on with the competitioners or to uh, scout talent. 
They yeah. let their friends, you know, or they, they let the regular roster help Paul. I mean, if it hadn't been for the fact that, um, I don't know, I know Joshua from, uh, from his days wrestling up here in Dallas, I may never have gotten a look see from, uh, Inspire Pro. And I had, you may not know this, Eamon, but I had, I had thrown my name in to be a part of the company when I heard that you guys were, were, were starting up. I was, I, I contacted Josh and I was like, look, it sounds a whole lot of fun. I've got family down in Austin, so you wouldn't have to worry about, they'll worry about like travel fees or anything like that because I'd be down to visit family and make the excuse of I'm here visiting family. Oh, and I just so have to have a wrestling show. So, <laughs> um, and it, it took me, what was it? It was, um, I believe you started maybe like a year, a year after we had start we had started uh, the company. Um, just about, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to say it was, I, I came to my first show, my first Inspire Pro show I came to in May. Okay. I and came, I, believe I, you started around, I believe you started around July too, um, uh, managing and then eventually working with me. Um, July, July or August, one of the two. Yeah. I think it, I, I, I want to say it was August, but um, I, my, my ill-fated management of, of young Eric Ortiz, bless his heart. <laughs> uh, very nice, very nice young man. Um, unfortunately for, for both he and I, um, quite literally, the very next month, well, all, all of Inspire Pro plans went sideways when the uh, wrestler was, that was his regular ride to Inspire Pro. Um, <clears throat> ceased to be booked for comments yes. made. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> well, fortunately, how that, that stuff kind of happens, but yeah. Well, yeah, um, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, and you mentioned even like you know on WWE you see like the likes of Paul Heyman and Zeb Coulter and a lot of now, uh, and even I would say that's more than what they've had as of late. I, and and that's only been recent. There's been really a, a deluge of managers in wrestling, being at least mainstream wrestling, for many years now. Uh, uh, do you predict it growing any further? Uh, uh, the role of a manager in professional wrestling now that you know there are the likes of a Paul Heyman and 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 others. Um, uh, filling those roles on mainstream areas. Do you think the the business for managers will grow any bit? Um, I'll, I'll say it this way. If NXT starts to utilize managers regularly in their show and, and promote managers and, and go back to the idea of uh, managers having stables like, you know, Bobby Heenan, uh, Heenan family and the Hart Foundation and, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, Devastation Incorporated and things, mm. things of that nature. Um, I think if NXT will start doing it, um, a, a lot more of wrestling will start doing it. Um, I really feel right now that NXT is kind of, the linchpin for everything because NXT seems to be doing everything that wrestling fans want to see. Um, and I really feel that NXT is, is, is quite literally the reason to pay nine ninety nine a month. I mean, don't get me wrong. WWE's pay-per-views are, are always fun. Um, even, it, 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 even, even if after over was it 13, 14 years, uh, <laughs> WWE decides to, to uh, parade out the uh, we're still better than WCW because look, ooh, we can still beat one of the champions um, <laughs> for no reason. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, I think that NXT is doing everything that fans want to see. Absolutely. I mean, from day from from day one when I saw NXT, I said, oh, oh, this is brilliant. This is what I this is what I watched first and foremost. This is why I came to the independence, and I became I I landed in the independence by accident. I I, I did not pursue it. Um, as a matter of fact, um, about eight nine years before I ended up in professional wrestling, a friend of mine suggested that 
we go and train uh, with PCW to be professional wrestlers. And I laughed at him. I said, can you see me in professional wrestling? You're bloody insane. It's not going to happen. It's stupid. Can you see me as a wrestler? It's not, it's not no. I mean, I'm, at, at, at my heaviest point, I was 180 pounds, and that was with the zero uh, athleticism, zero um, uh, working out. That was 110% video games and candy bars. That's what that was. That was quality weight. <laughs> and I mean, I, I thought my friend was insane. I, I now tell this story to the PCW guys that I'm friends with that had I had I gone and trained in 2000, I have, you know, broke in with them. Guys like, um, you know, Lance Hoy, you know, uh, Franco D'Angelo, and, you know, maybe not broken in with them, but been trained with them, been there with them. I think, <laughs> I think both Lance and, and Franco have got uh, a lot more than just the, what is it? So now it's, what, 14 years, 15 years? I really... As frustrating as it sometimes gets, I really have got a love for professional wrestling. Right. And a lot of love for a lot of the people that, I mean, I'm, I'm very blessed to know people like Amy. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, I well, he's, he's coming on here. But yeah, that's one thing I notice here is, is you know, uh, listen to you guys uh, uh, talk about things. Like, we, we talk about it on the show, and like, I you know, we think you kind of uh, partly asked the question, we asked what's a good thing and bad thing about What's going on in indie wrestling and one thing i don't think he's gone to is like what are you watching now i think we've really talked about that already but uh you know it feels like a lot of people on the indies are bitter and look at wwe it's like oh you know ah, it's not the stuff that i'm into it's like then what are you doing here that's the top rung and if that's not the goal if you're not impressed with what the most important like you said the the the, the highest profited part of the business is doing then what is your goal what is your aim you know well i i, I think I think part of the, 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 the issue with saying what if you're watching mm -hmm. and, and then looking and saying, you know, well, if you're not watching WWE, what are you doing? This for? Yeah. Um, WWE, although, although Vince McMahon would love for, for people to um, equate, uh, equate his product to be the end all be all. It is not the end all be all. No, and, and I not. don't mean, that, I don't mean that negatively. If, if, if anyone with uh, WWE is listening, I, it's just the, the simplest thing is I felt the WWE's product was on the top of its game when it had real competition. Certainly. I mean, I, I mean even if, if you go back and, you know, as I've stated, you know, I, I, I pay my nine ninety nine like the rest of, of the wrestling world <laughs> to watch the network. And one of the things that I've noticed uh, when watching the uh, Monday Night Wars documentaries is that uh, the Monday Night Wars consistently points out that professional wrestling had ne has never been as hot and was never as hot as it was during that what two three year span where WCW was actually fighting dirty and getting ahead of Vince McMahon <laughs> and Vince McMahon was pulling out every stop he could to keep competitive. Mm -hmm. Vince doesn't have to do that anymore. He's bought his competitors. It's only a matter of time until he buys TNA based off of what we see from TNA. It's, it, 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 it's, it's, I mean, there's nothing you can say about it except for the writing's already on the wall. Right. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm an avid reader, and, and, uh, and I'm an avid reader, but I, I tend to read uh, a lot of fiction, but where I tend to read a lot of nonfiction is uh, professional wrestling and professional wrestling histories and things of that nature. Uh, and the book that, um, the book I've now purchased two copies of, um, is um, Arby Reynolds and Brian Alvarez, uh, The Death of WCW, right, both the original right, printing and uh, the uh, anniversary printing that they just did here recently. Um, I, and I, I have to say, at, at the end of the book, as a matter of fact, I probably could find it if I got up off my bath, um, because the bookcase is right over there. It's not that far. I could probably reach a bookcase if I stood up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, it, in the back of the book, as, a, as kind of an afterword, um, it starts listing the mistakes that WCW had made. And then it starts listing the mistakes that TNA has made. Mm -hmm. And they're neck, I mean, they're neck and neck already. And we're talking about from, from we're talking about mistakes from 
when they were hot and WCW was the top wrestling product around to when they were bought by Vince McMahon. And TNA has been making all the same mistakes, doing all the same ludicrous things. Um, the, the Metroplex Wrestling, Metroplex Wrestling ha, 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 has been doing this bit with Jerome Daniels, uh, a flawless firm, Daniels. He's had a, 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 a faction there called the Trust Fund. And the Trust Fund is, is based uh, basically doing the whole, you know, money is everything. And they proceeded to do a, a program with uh, main event Mike Fox, telling Mike Fox that, you know, he is washed up, he's done, he's retired, he might as well just retire. There's no reason for him to be back. And they started a program with that, that whole thing in mind. Literally, the next, uh, the, the next TNA broadcast, TNA did the exact same angle with, um, oh, uh, MVP. They did the same angle with MVP. And I think it was MVP. Might have been EC3. I'm, I didn't watch it. I, I just listened to someone tell me about it and, and was just stunned. But they did the same angle with, with, with some, some well to do villain and, uh, Kurt Angle. And what it took, Metroplex Wrestling, who runs twice a month, what it took them two, three, maybe four months to run. TNA did it all in one night. They did a hot shot booking and something that they could have carried the company with mm-hmm. for a couple of months. They pissed away in an evening. I mean, it's insane. It, if, if TNA was an independent professional wrestling company, they'd be gone right now. They would. They wouldn't have. They they wouldn't have made it out of. Um, was it? Was the? What was the name of the 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 little person who was? He was a dwarf, and he ran around claiming he was a midget killer. Oh, was that? This is a, was that puppet uh, who who sort of? Yeah. Has, who Sorg has a past oh, history. Oh, we do not bring up Puppet on this show. <laughs> Sorg, has a, Sorg has a storied history. I kind of have a, I kind of had a run in with, with, with him on the former version of the show. So, uh, <laughs> we're not going to get it on Puppet. Let's just put it this way. Um, uh, if, if, if TNA was an independent pro- product, um, that, that didn't have anybody's big money behind it, mm-hmm. they'd be dead today. Because they stopped using psychotic little things like that. Crazy little pieces where you sit there and go, wait, the tag team's called the Johnsons, and they wrestle in flesh suits, and it covers the face and head, and they kind of look like giant penises, and they're called the Johnsons, and this is something that they're doing seriously? I, I, I've gotten the chance recently to watch some of their earlier stuff, and, and yeah, it's very much... They're they're very, they're very lucky enough to have gotten out of that uh, period of time. Well, certainly you're very lucky, but they haven't done anything better since. Yeah, I I tried watching them. I did. I really did because you know I'm I'm one of those wrestling fans that as as you can hear, um, I'm all for competition. And yeah. if I can if I can help create competition to stimulate both sides of the business, because I, I mean. It, it, I, I know very well that, that Vince McMahon has had a, a you know, I'm number one and, and no one's going to knock me off that peg. And the one person that did knock him off that peg, he took care of them quite well. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I want Vince to have to prove to me he's number one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, he can he can book great talent and he can tell us everything that he, he can tell us that John Cena is Superman every day of the week. And unless he makes me believe John Cena's Superman every day of the week, then you now I've got nothing for him except, oh well, all right. And and please don't take this as a criticism on Cena. I love John Cena. I've loved John Cena since uh, his debut match against Kurt Angle, um, in which he wrestled his heart out uh, and and did not come up with a victory, but came. Damn close, uh, and uh, he he won my fandom then, and no amount of WWE 
pushing him down people's throats is going to change, in my opinion, of the man's abilities. He's a gifted wrestler. People don't see, may not see it today because he's doing exactly what he needs to do as an employee of WWE, and that's what they tell him. Mm-hmm. Wow. And and the wrestling, the wrestlers today who hate on John Cena, if they ever make it to the WWE, are in for a world of surprise because they're going to end up having to do something similar. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's just like going and getting any uh, any booking. You are supposed to do X, Y, and Z. If you do P, D, and Q, you may never come back. And that's a fact. You know, I don't like them because, you know, sometimes I think I've got a better idea. Um, sometimes I'm right. More often I'm wrong. But, you know, as I continue to grow in the business, I, I get uh, a little bit wiser and a little bit better perspective on if I've got a better suggestion, how to properly approach it instead of just saying, well, that's dumb. I don't want to do that. Mm. Um, you know, which hopefully no one's ever thought that I've ever said that. Knock on wood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I I really think that when it comes to stuff that that wrestlers are watching today, we all want to be in the E because the E is where we are guaranteed to support our families and to truly live the dream. Mm -hmm. But as far as a product that we want to see, product we want to be a part of, product that we just want to be fans of, WWE is not that. Um, It's not that it's it's not that it's a bad product. Um, it, it just, well, like for example, with a three hour format, the three hour format, we get what well, about an hour of wrestling and two hours of drama and commercials. Mm-hmm. Well, it broke my heart. Um, uh, it was about, I guess about a month ago, maybe a little bit longer when, uh, uh, you, you've got, you know, uh, 99 heart, Standing behind a screen, and in comes uh, uh, in, in comes uh, uh, <laughs> Tyson, and Tyson is is you know talking all these wonderful things, and she's like, "Oh, thank you. Oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, I love you so much." And all of these wonderful things he's saying, he's shilling Burger King's chicken fries, <laughs> which I'm sure he ate what he had to eat on camera, and then did not finish them because. Um, that's, that's I'm, sure, I'm sure Burger King kitchen fries, chicken fries are not in his diet. <laughs> and I, I, I they, actually they. like like even watching like last night's show. One of my immediate thoughts was this is actually pretty good from what they've been doing lately. It would have been so much better if it was two hours instead of three, mm-hmm. because they would have condensed it enough to where there wasn't filler and, and stuff like that, and and you know that that it would be more of a refined show. Well, see, that's just it, though. I think I think the filler is the. I don't think the, I don't think we would have had a reduction of filler. That's really where the problem is. I mean, the reason why the three-hour formula works so well for WCW is that WCW, with the exception of that one Nitro that Nash booked, no wrestling. It was all story, for whatever reason. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> um, but I. WCW's basic formula was two hours of wrestling, one hour of drama, and mm-hmm. that worked. That gives it that, that, that gives you all of the extracurricular storytelling that you need, but gives the wrestling fans what they want. Uh, you know, luchadors wrestling, cr- cruiserweight matches, uh, you know, uh, real real confrontations between real talents. We just didn't sit there and go, "Oh, John Cena's going over." Oh. Randy Orton's going over. Um, you didn't. You 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 didn't really have that. I mean, they. One. Of the, I think one of the things that made WCW work so well is when they started. When they started, especially with the, with the NWO, they put everything on its ear because everybody was so used to the formula of okay, the bad guy's going to get up for a little while and then he's going to get knocked down, and it's going to be a big. Big, you know, a, a big knock now. You know, it's going to be a big deal, and you know that's going to be into the storyline. 
and they didn't do that because you know they they were they were making money with the films. Um, and you know it was like one of the few times in wrestling history that the villains were were drawing real merchandise numbers. So they went, ooh, let's continue this. And on one level, it was brilliant that they did. And on another level, they just continued to try and 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 milk that for everything it was worth. So then we end up with, um, then we end up with, well, if if one NWO is going to w- work real good, let's have two NWOs, okay? And they'll be fighting with each other. All right. Well, that adds an interesting aspect. Now, now we've got. We've got the heroes of WCW. We've got the villains of NWO, and then we've got the uh, we, we've got the kind of in between parties of NWO Wolfpack. So, kind of interesting. Um, starting to water down the NWO phenomenon, but but still kind of interesting. And then we've got the LWO, and then the OWN. And then we've got uh, the NWO B team because everybody's uh, joined back up, and you know because we can do this because I mean you know it worked so well you know uh, you know four or five years ago when I was probably like two three years ago NWO two two thousand yeah and and you know we'll do it this way we'll have a guy who hits people with guitars and refers to everybody as slap nuts that'll be brilliant. <laughs> and Jeff Jarrett, if for some bloody reason you're listening, you're so much better a wrestler than to hit people with guitars and call them slap nuts. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, I've seen some brilliant work out of you. And, and for that to be the legacy that most people associate with you is just terrible. You, you, I mean, oh, all drives me crazy. Drives me crazy when people undersell themselves. Drives me crazy. Uh, there, there, are, there are people out there who have got some real, solid, amazing talent that I'm not. I'm just not going to use it. Why? Well, because I get more heat if I hit you with the guitar and call you flat nuts. <laughs> Do you really? Do you really? Because mm, I think if you just out wrestle them and then just start smacking them in the back of the head, people get really kind of ticked with you, and then you pray around like you're like you're something wonderful. Yeah. I mean, and <laughs> and I mean, Kurt Hennig's one of the the the, the, the best examples of of that antic right there. But he was not the person to invent that bit. It's not his spot. He just did it often because he could. And there's so many other people in, in, in wrestling who should get away with it. You know, if I, if, if I could collegially out-wrestle anybody on the mat and, and, and whirl myself about you and then you know, pop up and paintbrush the back of your head and then stand there looking like I'm you know, some kind of you know, Adonis. And I do it all the time because it really makes the fans mad. Well, and if you're a baby face and you decide to do that back, oh, look what you did to the heel. Oh, and the fans love you all the more because now the heel's getting what he got mm-hmm. or getting what he's getting what he's given. So. Yeah, definitely. I think the, the simple stuff like that, people don't always understand it is the stuff that gets some, some, some of the stuff I see that gets real heat and, and, and gets fans into it. It's just simple stuff like that. It doesn't need to be, you know, over elaborate. So definitely, I, I, I definitely agree. Um, I, I don't know if we touched on the, the big questions when I was uh, uh, out of action there, thanks to Google Hangout. Um, but, uh, but uh, I, I believe we sort of covered a lot of, of, of the topics in that. Um, and, and thank you very much, Nigel, for coming on and, and talking oh, yeah. uh, talking shop with us. Uh, uh, definitely a big pleasure. Um, if people listening want to find you on uh, the Internet, various social medias, uh, or in any upcoming events that you're going to be a part of, uh, feel free to uh, plug away. Uh, well, I mean, you can always find me on Twitter at, uh, at Nigel Rabbit, or you can find the uh, Rabbit Empire uh, at The Rabbit Empire. Um, I'm all, we're also on Twitter, Twitter. No, that is Twitter. In, Instagram, Instagram at uh, at the Rabbit Empire on Instagram. Um, uh, I have a fan page and a, uh, a fan page for myself and a fan page for the Rabbit Empire on uh, uh, Facebook, and you can find uh, both on uh, Google Plus. Uh, we're in the process of working up a website so that uh, uh, I can have some 
real web presence as opposed to borrowing web presence from Facebook and, and Google+. Plus. Um, let's see. Uh, I'd, I'd say Tumblr, but I'll be completely and totally honest. I haven't done anything with my Tumblr in almost a year <laughs> and a half, two years. I, I don't understand the whole thing, to be completely honest. <laughs> Yeah, um, see, see, there's, I know there's more. I know there's more. Um, see, I did Instagram, I did Twitter, I did Facebook, I did Google Plus. Um, oh yeah, you can find, uh, you can find, um, uh, some of the, some of our, our things on YouTube. Yeah. Um, with, uh, if you look for the Rabbit Empire, uh, um, it, it should all be tied to Google Plus, but if you were, uh, uh, technological Luddite like myself, um, you probably just, you know, surf around things and find it. Um, see, um, keyword Nigel Rabbit and, uh, uh, the Rabbit Empire. If you're hearing a dulcet tone in the background, that would be my lovely wife. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh she, <laughs> she, she's, uh, coaching me through the technological. Um, for any, anyone out there who, uh, for anyone out there who uh, uh, um, uh, has any web pages or anything like that, um, uh, send an email to jesse at seodogs.com so that you can get search engine optimization for uh, your professional wrestling business. Uh, and they also do web design and they'll help you get mobile, um, uh, as in like full of mobile devices. Um, I, I can be found at, uh, let's see, I'll be at uh, Full Throttle Wrestling. Uh, this Friday in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, I will be at uh, uh, NWA Texoma on, I want to say it's the 16th, and then NWA Top of Texas in Amarillo on the 17th. Uh, and then, of course, I'll be uh, doing everything I can to join my lovely broadcast partner, at uh, Inspire Pro on the 31st of May, uh, and I will also be, if uh, everything goes to plan, uh, escorting uh, uh, Thomas Shire to the ring. While uh, I've been told here recently he is not actually the pure prestige champion any longer, I will point out that most uh, the, the most common colloquialism when it comes to property and the law is possession is nine-tenths of the law. So at the very least, he's nine tenths the pure prestige champion. Um, Th at th least thanks to you, uh, uh, banding me at my post to, to, to take the pure prestige championship and run out the door. Very much appreciated. I, I, I was, I only took it because Mr. B was stealing it and you saw him go to steal it. You saw him pick it up and steal it. I was just rescuing it because to be completely and totally honest, I think a title should be won, not stolen. I did not realize that Mr. Shire did not win the match until someone had sent me a message on Twitter. I've been trying to send it back to Mr. True, but I cannot for the life of me find the address of the bridge he lives under in Austin. So, oh, okay. you know, there's, there's that. I, I hope, well, hopefully things can, things can work out on the 31st and, and you and, and, uh, and, and Mr. Chris True up is and, and Keith Lee can get that, uh, can get that thing settled. Uh, but definitely. Well, so certainly, and, and you know, I've, the one thing I'm, I'm truly looking forward to, and that is the fact that, you know, as you and I have discussed a number of times, Mr. Shah has a tremendous wrestling pedigree, uh, and to be working with Mr. Shah is, is, uh, well, it, it, it's an honor, and I, I, I look forward to doing more of it. Um, well, it's, I, I have to say, you know, I've been truly, professionally, very blessed here in the past uh, past uh, year, year and a half, two years. Um, what between Metroplex Wrestling, uh, North Texas Wrestling Alliance, NWA Texoma, Inspire Pro, um, even even Coastal Wrestling Federation, um, I, I, I've been truly, truly blessed and have been given a lot of opportunities to grow. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm hopefully going to continue to Grow not just professionally, but grow my my uh, uh, my reach so as to, to extend beyond Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma, and and really kind of start uh, taking this show on the proverbial road. No, take it on the literal road. <laughs> Sounds much more profitable, doesn't it?
Definitely. Uh, hopefully, hopefully the Rabbit Empire uh, can expand uh, and 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 grow even bigger. Uh, so once again. Uh, thank you very much, Nigel, for uh, coming on. And I believe me and Sorg are going to dive into some of the stuff happening in the world of independent wrestling this week. That's right, Eamon. Uh, what a great – it was a long conversation, but I thought it was just such a great conversation about pro wrestling in general. Uh, so so thanks you know, uh, for that. Uh, but let's uh, touch base with a couple of things coming up in pro wrestling here in the coming weeks. First of all, locally, of course, friends of the show, lots of them on the card – for Five Star Wrestling, uh, really uh, a kind of an upcoming promotion that's outside of town here up in East Brady, PA. Uh, they actually have some stuff going on on YouTube, and you can actually check that out at youtube.com slash uh, the FSW Wrestling. And our friend Rob Brown has been helping us out actually locally uh, with with the, uh, the IWC wrestling and everything like that is actually uh, putting together a video there. Uh, and, and like I said, friends of the show like Serafini, Andrew Palace, and uh, other guys that we, we, we wish we'd be getting on the show sooner. The Chess Flexor is, uh, is a part of this. I believe he's a tag champion he's down there with Corey Futuristic. So uh, please check them out. It's at fswwrestling.com. Like I said, check out their YouTube and you can see uh, what some of our friends of the show are up to there. And also coming up, and this was, uh, oh, uh, Remix Pro Wrestling. Uh, Facade versus uh, Mr. AJ Styles 2, I believe. This nice. is Throwdown for the Pound, another one. Uh, they've done, done one of these before. And uh, involved in this, Mickey James, as well as the Bull Clubs, like I mentioned, AJ Styles, and, of course, uh, the Young Bucks are part of this. A uh, remix nice. has a lot of fun stuff going on. It looks like a lot of familiar faces. Jock Sampson's a part of this as well against Marion Fontaine. Uh, sassy Stuff, Beta Scott, and Lufisto in a three-way uh, Rose Rumble for the Fury Champ- Championship. Uh, Athena, who I believe you just mentioned, yeah. taking on Mickey James. And uh, Chance Prophet, I, I, I narrowly avoided seeing him in in the matches for VOW, <laughs> so <laughs> and he's actually I think is he teaming with the Young Bucks, yes, against the Headless Horman, which involves of course Gory, um, and so much more. Uh, actually, wait, wait, there's like Chris Larusso on this card too. You're coming in love last week's yes, Chris Larusso. That's right, taking on Omega Aaron Draven. Uh, nice. Zach Vincent and Onyx. So uh, Zach Vincent. I've been hearing a lot about Remix Pro actually, just from seeing their stuff, uh, you know, while searching for things. This looks um, good. And I believe, good and I believe they're also on Smart Mark Video, mm-hmm. so um, definitely can go check them out there as well. Certainly, uh, Remix Pro Wrestling do some cool stuff over there, and I know I think Joe Dabrowski has been a part of uh, what they're doing out there too, if I'm not mistaken. I say guys like Facade and, and everything too. So awesome. Uh, so please go check that out, Remix Pro Wrestling. Dot com and also check out my random of the week prime time wrestling not yeah. the wwf show you can find out on the network not the prime time players shirt that looks a lot like the logo for that but uh <laughs> pt wrestling.com they got actually a really good looking website over here and they do have ver- uh episodes of videos and it's really nice over here so let's oh, wow. click on one of these and yeah they got they got their show up there you can check out and see what they have going on as well. So go. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about some of these wrestlers I'm seeing when I pop in here, but uh, but it looks decent otherwise. So that's something you can check out at ptwrestling.com. So on that note, this gets weird. Is this a wedding video? It's a dove, and then it turned into I think it's a production company commercial or something. Oh. <laughs> but uh, it got. The yeah. wrestling dove. I, 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 I don't know what's happening here. I, I hope it was going to be as good as uh, Space Monkey. This, Oh, Space Monkey. We'll talk about Space Monkey in the coming weeks, I believe, uh, <laughs> as I've mentioned before. But he got booked on the IWC's uh, The Dance Road to Super Indie coming up next month. Uh, and I can't wait for that. Uh, by popular demand, apparently. So, of course. I mean, it's Space Monkey. It's Space Monkey. Come on. That's something you don't see in pro wrestling. And uh, it could be a lot of fun. So look out for that that's all i got uh to keep an eye out for this week i know we had a lot of conversation already about wrestling in general it was a lot of fun i'm really glad you're a compatriot he's got to be a lot of fun after the show at the bar definitely absolutely (laughs) (laughs) absolutely um 
uh, the only thing I, I do want to also mention is uh, we because we did have uh, two weeks ago we had Evangelistico on the show mm-hmm. and uh, St. Louis Anarchy did have their uh, their get, uh, Gateway to Anarchy weekend of events this past uh, weekend and from what I heard sounded like an amazing success uh, as we talked with Evan on in the interview uh, they're partnering with Smart Mark Video now to do their production and nice. now the I believe the event's going to be coming out in about three weeks or so so I would encourage you to go check it out because there's a really good lineup of guys. Uh, on that event, and 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 looks like some really good stuff coming out from St. Louis Anarchy. So, awesome, awesome. Go check it out. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, with that, check out. Uh, of course, you're at AM Two Please on the Twitters and Inspire Pro Wrestling. Yep, InspireProWrestling dot com. All our stuff is at SorgatronMedia.com. Please check out IndieWrestling.us, RWA Spring Fling, as far as as well as the recent IWC Best of 2014 and IWC's uh, Super. Uh, Night of the Superstars, including guys like Kevin Nash, Ric Flair, uh, Evan, uh, excuse me, Matt Seidel against DJ Z, Zima Ion, which was a tremendous match from mm. that night, and so much more. And we got videos over on the YouTube for IWCWrestling.com, including a little bit of the controversy over the three-way dance for a number one contender, including ROH's Dalton Castle. I love I can say that now. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, 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 Colin Delaney and RJ City and, uh, and a few other kind of special things that have been going around the internet from there. And RWA, there's going to be uh, the digital for Spring Fling, including the... I didn't get into this, of course, but the uh, fan participation strat match with Shane Andrews and Sanjay Dutt and, and a lot of other fun stuff going on there. Uh, should be releasing some videos there in the next coming days. In relation to that DVD and digital release, and check out all that stuff. That is, that stuff is also over on Smart Mark Video <laughs> for IWC and the RWA. Um, so thank you, and check us out wrestlingmamshow.com. And please contact us at good time at wrestlingmamshow.com if you have any comments, questions, anybody we should be talking about or to. Uh, or four one two two zero six WMS zero is the hotline. Check out basicsickness.com and everything else going on at wrestlingmamshow.com. Subscribe, follow us, all that kind of stuff. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Scheduled is Samantha Starr of Vicious Outcast Wrestling. We'll see you. And support Indie Wrestling. Joe is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. Do you like professional wrestling? Want your discussions? No holds barred. Check out WrestlingMayhemShow.com for all the wrestling podcast flavor you can handle.